Chapter 2 of Habakkuk is where we're going today. Chapter 2, I uh, labeled this one, the questions keep coming. So we see that uh, this continues the exchange between God and Habakkuk uh, that began in chapter 1. And uh, man, what a privilege it is really to be looking over Habakkuk's shoulder as he is speaking with God and God's answering him. This is, again, a good reminder that if we have honest questions for God, uh, to he will answer them. Uh, at some point, uh, the answers stop, uh, that he has revealed to us certain things and kept the secret things to himself. But he is gracious and he is righteous. And uh, like the prophet, if we're walking with the Lord, uh, sometimes the Lord is going to do things that confuse us. And he is going to, uh, we're going to ask him, and he's going to lead us into his word and teach us and answer those questions for us and bring us to himself. So as we look at chapter 2, I want to look at it under basically three headings. We see in verse 1, Habakkuk's resolve. Then we see God's answer in verses 2 through 19. And then again, the, clo the it closes with Habakkuk's resolve in verse 20. So in between... This resolution of Habakkuk, we have God's answer. So, let's take a look at verse 1. I will stand on my guard post uh, and station myself on the rampart and will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. So here we have a very humble prophet. He's picturing himself... Perhaps he's, this is literal. He's climbed up onto the walls around Jerusalem. He stationed himself there as a faithful uh, lookout. And he's watching for God to come and answer his question. And he's fully expecting to be reproved here. He's fully expecting to be what we'd say corrected or at least uh, made aware of his deficiency in his thinking. So, uh, again, no... Uh, shame in asking honest questions from the Lord. No shame in doing that. And God uh, answers that. The Lord, in verse 2, answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. So this is important. God's calling him to write down. We talk about uh, the inspiration of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed. We see that here. Habakkuk's being told to write down what God's about to tell him. He wants it preserved. This is going to be an important message uh, for not only Habakkuk, but for future generations. It says, for the vision is yet for the appointed time and hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. So this is a message that for the future. Let's write this down and we're going to write it in big letters. Uh, when he talks about that he who uh, the, who reads it may run. I think the picture here is of a, a messenger with the scroll in his hands written large so that as he runs to and fro through Jerusalem and Judea, he is reading this as he goes and letting people know what's going on. So this is really of vital importance to Israel, uh, people that uh, Habakkuk is speaking to. It's also of vital importance to the church. Uh, Romans, again, 15.4 tells us that we are to read the things that were written formerly to, for our encouragement and to give us strength and give us hope. So that's what we do here. And then in verse 4, God says, Behold. So it's as if he's pointing a finger. Behold, check this out. Look at this. He's saying the proud one. He's talking about the, Assyri the uh, Babylonians here. His soul is not right within him. Uh, he's, he's, there's something wrong with these guys. They're sinners. That's what's wrong with their soul. Uh, they're unredeemed sinners. They're sick. Uh, they're driven by their lusts. They're driven by their passions. They're driven not by God's word, uh, but uh, they're driven by what they want when they want it. And in contrast to that in verse 5, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 4, is the righteous. Uh, the righteous will live by faith. Very important verse here. Very important verse. Used several times in the New Testament. Uh, three times to be exact. Um, 
rather than live according to their arrogance, rather than live according to their pride, rather than live according to their broken soul, the righteous person lives by faith in Habakkuk's time, in the time of the Apostle Paul, and also our time. Paul uses this verse three different times. He uses it first in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, and he uses it to back up his assertion that the righteous among the Hebrews, the righteous among those he's writing to, build their lives on faith. That's the basis of their life, not their pride, uh, not the s notions of a sick soul, but faith, dependence, reliance, trusting in God. Sometimes we get confused or try to get very abstract or esoteric when we talk about faith. And faith in the Bible is just acting on the promises of God. That's what he's saying here to the Hebrews. Those who live by faith are the righteous. They act on the promises of God. Paul uses this verse in Romans. In fact, some have said that the whole book of Romans is really an exposition of this particular verse, the righteous will live by faith, with Paul quotes uh, in Romans 10.16 to, sure, to make the point that the center of the gospel is faith, acting on that gospel, acting on the promise of God is faith. And in verses uh, chapter 3, verse 20 to the end of chapter 4, he really builds on that theme of faith and the righteous living by faith. He uses this verse again in Galatians 3 uh, to show that a right relationship with God always has been based on faith and not the law, that it's faith alone that saves Faith alone that establishes that right relationship. And let me say, brothers and sisters, that when I'm talking about faith in a right relationship, I'm talking not only about that moment of salvation, but also that whole time of sanctification. That as we work out, as Philippians says, our salvation, that it requires faith, that we act on the promises of God, not the desires of our flesh, not the pressures of the world, not the influence of Satan, but we stand firm and operate and live by the promises of God. Then, having established that, that the righteous live by faith, uh, he goes on in verses 6 to 19, and I'll just summarize it to talk about his case against the Chaldeans. So, on the one hand, we have the righteous standing firm, Habakkuk is an example of that. He's an example of it at the beginning of the chapter and at the end. Uh, he's an example of the righteous standing firm by faith. In the between is the Chaldeans. They're greedy and they're going to be judged for that greed. They're building a house of cards. Uh, they are manipulating people. They are taking advantage of their enemies and their allies. And they're really ultimately building a house of cards in verses 9 to 11. God calls them out for their overweening, uncontrollable violence in verses 12 through 14. And they're just disgraceful attitudes and actions in verses 15 through 17. Finally, kind of the culmination of all that is their idolatry. That they are ultimately, and this is the most uh, heinous thing, from God's perspective, is their idol worshipers. Everything flows out of their idolatry. So just as the chapter began with um, Habakkuk standing firm, waiting for God, so it ends again with Habakkuk standing firm. In this case, he's humbled. But the Lord is in his holy temple, verse 20. Let all the earth be silent before him. So Habakkuk has gotten his answer. This is good enough for him. God is going to, um, now is the time for Habakkuk to respond, not with another question, but with reverence, with silence, with worship. Something very similar happens in chapter 9, verse 20 of the book of Romans, where God is explaining his selection, his election of Israel from all the other nations. 
And uh, the questions could just keep coming and coming and coming. But finally, Paul says, uh, who are you, O oh man, to question the living God? I think we all come to that point. Um, by God's grace, our questions, as we dig into the Bible, as we dig into God's word, as we immerse ourselves in prayer, we get to that point where we just can't get any further. Maybe you've experienced it like I have, that uh, the more you study God's word, the more you meditate on it, the more you realize how little you know. And at some point, uh, rather than wear yourself out trying to know everything, you have to bow the knee and worship God. And I pray, brothers and sisters, that as you work your way through the book of Habakkuk, as you pursue your own questioning, as you pour yourself into God's word and God pours his word into you, that you too would find yourself at some point brought to that place, not where you figured out God that's not going to happen, but rather where God has called you and said, rest, worship me. God bless you, brothers and sisters.